Okay. Awesome. Well, y'all, thank you again so much for coming today. Truly excited to get to know all of y'all and, and really glad that this is a small group. So please um, ask questions throughout, drop them in the chat, come off mute. Um, definitely, this is your time to really get that, that support and get those questions answered. We are going to cover a lot today. And so again, don't feel like you need to memorize anything. This is recording, so I will send it out. I'll also send you an email afterwards with lots of different um, information and you'll have my contact information. So I really encourage you to give me a call, um, reply to the emails. We can always schedule a chat and, and happy to help support you. So um, majority of, of you here, all of you here, you know, may not have um, a lot of background into the tech industry and, and that's okay. We really are helping folks who have zero to very little experience in tech. Um, so you're in the right place. Um, what we're first going to do looking at the agenda is we're just going to kind of talk about what the job market looks like. What is that outlook? Um, then we will break down um, what are those no code roles that you can get in the tech space. So sales and customer success, digital marketing, operations, which is project management, and then product management. I will also then um, pause for, for questions at, at all of those points, but we'll definitely have another pause um, for questions before we get started into, hey, how can School 16 support you and what, are the, what do those next steps look like? Okay. So I've worked with tons of students over the years who are considering making a career change into tech. And one of the first things they ask me is, did I miss the chance? Um, is they, they all think that it's oversaturated or there's, we're in a bubble. And we definitely get that a lot more as we hear about those layoffs at some of those high profile companies like Netflix, Meta, Google, et cetera. However, that's just not the case. And the numbers here are really showing that. The layoffs that you hear about, I don't want to downplay at all because those are very real. Um, however, overall, we are seeing a net job growth in the tech industry across the board. CompTIA um, in December, they put out a report that showed um, that in that month of, in December, they added 17,600 workers to the industry, making it the 25th straight month of net employment growth in the tech industry. So even though we hear about all of those layoffs, we are still seeing a net growth. We love to cling to those big stories when it comes to layoffs, but if you're not part of the industry, you also just don't realize how many tech companies exist um, and how many you probably have never heard of. So tech doesn't just mean social media and streaming services. Think about cloud-based companies, ed tech, fintech, fashion tech. Aaliyah, you were talking about kind of using your social impact. So ed tech is a great place that we see a lot of folks who have worked more in the humanity side um, find a space in tech. Really any industry, if you add tech behind it, you're almost guaranteed to find a small, medium, or large company that exists and that's hiring and growing. We're also starting to see a lot more opportunities when it comes to AI, which is definitely going to benefit employees as they seek um, job opportunities in the industry. So that's been really exciting. Um, we also see salaries continue to rise for all of the jobs in the tech industry, but especially for folks with three plus years experience. So Hired.com, they put out a 2022 state of salaries report, and that was where they found that when you start to get that traction in the industry, that's where you really can start seeing those salary increases. So I like to note that, that it's just important to start making those career moves now so that you have that financial flexibility the longer that you're in the industry. Um, it's also important to remember that all of your academic and previous work experience counts, even if it's not directly related to tech. So it's really about framing that experience to make sense for the tech job you're applying for. Okay. So also a lot of people assume that the only jobs in tech are for software, software developers and other technical roles. I'd mentioned AI, and there's a lot of opportunity for those more technical positions, but every company needs a sales team. They need a marketing department. They need operations. So somebody behind the scenes, um, ultimately serving the growth and development of the company. So really today we're going to focus on those non-technical roles. Oops. There we go. 
So every company, they need a, a team that's going to drive the business and retains the business. And in the tech industry, you're going to see the sales department broken into two parts before the deal closes and then after the deal closes. So job titles such as business or sales development rep, account manager, account executive, these are gonna be the employees who are responsible for bringing business in the door and closing the deals. Once the deal is closed, the sales team's gonna hand off those new clients to their customer success team. That team's goal is to make sure that their new client is using the product effectively, help solve problems and make sure they renew their contract. So customer success, that, those are the roles um, that you hear for after the deal is closed. And, and those are the folks that are retaining that business. A lot of people can confuse customer success with customer service reps. Um, the names are very similar, but they're gonna still do pretty different things. Customer success is more about the sales aspect of it. So they, like I said, wanna make sure that the client renews their business and they're also gonna try to upsell when new products are added. So when you think about Salesforce, initially you get one package when um, you know a, a company starts using Salesforce, but then they have all of these other features. So as I work with their customer success team, based on my business's needs, they're going to recommend other products for me to purchase, to add on, to help grow the size of that deal. Relationship building, collaborator, strong communication, proactivity, and problem solver are going to be some of the top skills employers are looking for. Um, I always say a sales position is really great for entry-level folks, but also for people who are mid-career changers. Um, Sales positions are super useful in gaining experience as you have to learn not only your product and become an expert in it, but you really have to start to learn your competitors' products. So that's just going to make you more of an expert in the industry itself. And it's going to also help make you more marketable as you're trying to get that second, third, fourth job in the industry to grow that salary. Um, you also get to work both internally and externally with lots of different teams. Um, so it's also great to just help elevate your networking game and help you gain valuable connections at lots of exciting companies um, in those sales roles. Sale, sales positions are great for entry-level folks, um, so that's why you see there can be a pretty wide salary range, and if you're successful in the role, it's really easy to move up and start earning a higher base pay. Um, the nice thing also about sales in tech positions is you get typically a base pay plus commission and bonuses. So with customer success managers, if they can retain X amount of business um, or upsell X amount of revenue, they can get commission on that or pretty large bonuses at the end of the year or quarterly. Same when it comes to the folks bringing in the business. So I want to pause here and see, like, is anybody interested in sales and customer success? Is this like a space that excites you? I am. I really was interested in customer success, especially just based mm -hmm. on what I've done in the past. Um, I've done sales. I've done marketing. I've done customer service. I've done um, like coordinating um, all kinds mm -hmm. of different stuff. So it's, and I like to help people. So I always kind of looked at sales as like sort of a part of helping people. So I wasn't thinking about it as much as like just selling something to someone. So I thought yeah. that was, that seemed like a really cool role, I thought. I love that because I used to, I started out my career in sales and then I transitioned to marketing and now I'm back in sales. And I kind of like pushed myself out of it because at the time I was selling things I didn't care about. So it just yeah. like felt icky, but right. like when I sell something that I'm really excited and passionate about, and I believe it, then I'm just like talking with my friends. I'm just like, I, I would tell you the same thing. I would tell my husband or my best friend or whatever. So I love that. That's how you, you look at sales as well. It's yeah. about finding the right thing that makes sense for you to sell that you believe right. in. Yeah, definitely. Love it. Love that. Anybody else interested in sales? And CSM, no worries. If not, we're going to talk about other stuff too. So, yeah, I'm also, Chelsea. I'm also getting uh, back to Aaliyah in the uh, in the chat there about uh, some CSM stuff too. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep uh, on top of the chat too. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate that. And and Aaliyah, feel free to come off mute at any time too if it's easier. Um, but drop them in the chat too. Um, whatever works for you works for us. 
Okay, we're gonna hop um, to marketing now. Oops, let me get this out of the way. Cool. Um, so we know social media plays a huge role in people's purchasing decisions. Um, so I think a lot of folks instantly think that, um, you know, oh, I have a really great personal social media page. I can help a tech company grow their brand. Um, however, that's not always the case. And digital marketers, they're not just creative and know how to put together an aesthetically pleasing Instagram grid. They're also strong copywriters who love digging into data and analytics. Um, digital marketing is what consumers see before a salesperson even calls them on the phone. Um, so they're responsible for brand awareness and really driving leads to the sales team. They do this through social media, email marketing, SEO, which is search engine opera, um, optimization. Um, they do it through influencer marketing campaigns, as that's a really big space now as we see TikTok growing tremendously. Um, they collaborate with developers as well to build user-friendly websites and so much more. So definitely, if you're, you love social media and you have a really great personal brand, this could be a great space for you. But I think it's really important to just note how broad marketing is. And like me, I did a lot of marketing in my past. And if you were to like look at my social media, it's trash. I don't focus on that. But I can put together a, a grid and um, strong copy and, um, you know, clickable can't like a, a strong um, clickable campaign for a social media um, for a company. So don't sell yourself out if it's not something that you do personally, um, but also know that if it is something that you're strong in personally, there's a lot of different avenues you can go to with marketing. Um, some of the job titles that you'll hear is content marketer, influencer, marketing campaign manager, product marketer, digital marketing specialist, um, email marketer, all of those words are kind of going to be the words that you'd search for um, as you look for those jobs. When we think about transferable skills, um, writing and editing and the ability to make data-driven decisions are top skills that employers are going to look for in marketers. They want somebody who is able to multitask, is creative, adaptable, and a strategic thinker to be part of their team. I also want to state again, creativity um, is it's having that baseline design knowledge is super valuable to have um, if you are joining a marketing department, but creativity is so much broader than that as well. Um, when you think of sales, it's, hey, like I need to be creative with how am I engaging with my customer? Um, that's creativity. So creativity isn't limited to, again, just being able to throw together a beautiful um, ad um, in and be, being able to design that. Typically, tech companies have a, a graphic design department. So again, having baseline understanding of your of, of design skills is really all you need because you're not going to be the one creating the social media post, creating the ad. You're going to send that off to another team. Um, so don't sell yourself out if you know you you don't have those like initial skills you think of. Marketing roles definitely are competitive, but it still is a really great place to start your career because there are lots of entry level positions available. If you don't have experience, I always encourage folks to like reach out to your local coffee shop, um, a small business, maybe even the current company that you work for if they don't have a, like a, a strong social media presence um, and just run, run their social media pages to get a taste of what that entry level position looks like. Um, start thinking about like, hey, I posted this, I got zero likes. Now, what am I going to change? Because um, so, that's then getting into that A-B testing. That's getting into those data-driven decisions um, that, that you're going to want to have um, experience doing when you're applying for those roles. So um, due to the importance of marketing and brand awareness, you really can have a long career in marketing at large um, because at large tech companies, they have huge marketing teams with massive budgets. So you can see salaries going all the way up into six figures, but you can also work at a startup and get, gain so much experience and still have a really strong salary as well. So don't, don't think that you have to go to a, tech com a large tech company to get those big salaries. That can happen at a small startup as well. I wanna pause here and see if this is an area that interests any folks. Um, Chelsea, if you don't mind me asking, um, 
I, I'm, I love writing. So this, mm -hmm. a lot of parts of this interest me, even if mm -hmm. I want to sort of strengthen like my copywriting skills, um, especially mm -hmm. working for like an advertising company for, mm -hmm. you know, the length of time mm -hmm. that I did, but um, what, how did you get like as good at copywriting as you did or what resources did you use? Did you go to school for it or did you kind of just mm -hmm. like, on the side if I might ask? Great question. I guess I've always enjoyed writing. Um, just in school, I did really well. So I think for me, it not necessarily comes naturally, but like I enjoyed reading. So I had like, you know, I kind of learned from like the different like authors that I would read and, and then I would play around and practice growing up with my copywriting skills. So that was I, I think in that sense, it was just like a natural um, segue for me to start getting into um, writing. I then was at a job that I hated. So I quit and I'm like, I'm going to be a freelance writer. Right. And that's where then I really started to challenge myself more um, in, okay, how many different voices can I speak in? Um, what, like, what companies do I like writing for? And I ended up getting a long-term um, contract that turned into full-time employment with a marketing agency. So then working with them, um, they really helped me kind of figure out how do I change my tone, my voice um, to match the client that we're working for. Um, I would also have really long discussions with my client of like, what is the voice that we're going for here? Okay. During that time, I realized I don't like writing in any voice other than my own. So mm -hmm. I realized also <laughs> freelance writing isn't for me long term. I realized it was really pushing me outside of my comfort zone and not in a way that I wanted to grow in. You know, sometimes it's good to be pushed outside of your comfort zone. I wasn't really in the mood for it. So that's when I slowly kind of um, pivot, started pivoting my career again. Um, and I, I still was working in like a communications marketing role, but got with this company that um, it was a nonprofit. I worked at, as, at it, as an advocacy manager. So I started helping with organizing, which is kind of like sales in a sense, you're building long-term relationships with folks. And then that got me into tech. So that's like a long story. Is that helpful? Yeah. yeah thank you. And, and Heather, yeah, I'll yeah. jump in super quickly too. Uh, Cause I don't, I, I know we have other stuff to get through here and we're getting close to time already. So I'll be super fast. Uh, but uh, I also did a, a ton of copywriting content writing over the years. I actually had the English degree from my background. So uh, writing has always been an interest to me and uh, you know, I have some formal training in writing, but it is completely different when you're writing for business purposes than when you're, you know, creative writing poetry major, which is what I was before. So um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there's something to uh, a formula, though, and I will say, like, some of what you find as you get into copywriting is there is some of it that's formulaic. There is, a, you know, an amount of characters in a, in a subject line that, you know, will be more likely to convert an audience to open an email or there are uh, there, there there is a word count that's appropriate for an email to get the most uh, likelihood of conversion. There are lengths of content written posts, you know, that are most likely to be read and consumed and shared. And, you know, there's certain topics that are most likely to attract people. So you start to understand some of the formula behind it. Uh, and I think, you know, if you start paying attention for that, looking for that, reading articles and things like that, you can start actually figuring some of that stuff out uh, ahead of time and practicing any time that you really want to. Uh, and just, you know, uh, have that keen eye, though, as you go forward, as you're looking at marketing from different companies and how do they market their products and how do they position things? And do you find similarities and thematic uh, sequences that it seems like some of them are using? But, you know, all of them use like email marketing trip campaigns. That's one area where you can definitely do copyright. Writing, you know, there's site copywriting, as Chelsea said, like you really have to understand the voice of the customer and, and the kind of persona that your business targets or the, you know, the personas that your business targets so you can understand how to write to that audience and how to communicate value to that audience. So there is like something that's, you know, logic based in, in the writing process, uh, which I think is also, uh, you know, as uh, critical uh, sometimes as the creative portion of it. So I also wanted to highlight that part of it um, in case that's of interest for you. Yes, thank you so much. I of course. It.
Yeah, really great question. I always am a, like a firm believer of also being inspired by others' work. So if you know the industry that you're in, so or or want to get into, so let's say you want to get into fintech, um, start looking at fintech companies. What is the copy on their website? What are the social media posts that are getting a lot of likes? Um, because it's not just about followers. It's are people engaging with that content? Um, sign up for their email drip campaigns and just getting a sense. And you'll start to see that every fintech company probably has 10 buzzwords that they're using. So you know that when you get to the interview process and they're like, hey, for the interview, we want you to create an email drip, you know 10 buzzwords off the bat that you need to add into there because everybody else is doing it. So it's not like copying what others are doing, but we're being inspired and you see a similarity between lots of companies and the way that they frame their message. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, really great question. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so operations, um, project management. Um, this really is such a necessary, critical role for any organization to survive. And tech companies have dozens of projects happening all the time, and they really need to rely on project managers um, to ensure that those projects are completed on time and successfully. Projects is a very broad term, and it really can mean so many different things from internal to external work, supporting multiple departments, working directly with the CEO. Um, but regardless of the project, the, oper the operations team needs to be organized, be able to wear multiple hats, and they're usually going to be behind the scenes, making sure that things are running smoothly. So I think of like an example of a project that they could work on is let's say you work for, um, I don't know, Zoom. Um, you work for Zoom, the, the platform that we're on, and they have a customer relationship management system that has all of their customer base. But they're realizing that this CRM system is no longer serving their needs. They're, they're, um, they're at the package limits. So they're going to put their project managers on to say like, hey, we need a new CRM system. Figure that out. So what you then have to do is you need to meet with your sales team and figure out what are all the things that make this CRM system effectively. You need to figure out who outside of my sales teams is using this. You need to then search and um, research all the different CRM systems that exist. Um, once you get that baseline research, then you're gonna say, okay, by May 1, we are gonna have a new CRM system. This is the budget that we have. And now we're gonna start making sure all of that happens. Once now the CRM system is implemented, now you need to make sure that everybody's using it because you just spent all of that time um, putting that together. Your CEO had you putting all of this together. Now we need to make sure that our sales team is using it and using it to its full benefits. So that would be a project that um, an internal project that a project manager could work on. An external project could be like, hey, Zoom is releasing a new feature. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's a new feature that they are now adding um, to their package. And so we need to make sure that we have an email campaign that's going out. So our project manager needs to work with the, um, the marketing team. They need to work with sales. They may be talking with product managers, et cetera, to just make sure that this product is released on time on budget and is successfully going. So those are like two like very broad examples of like projects, but really that is the name of the game with project managers. And I think that we see a lot of folks excited about project management because it is constantly doing something different. Um, organization, time management, the ability to collaborate with others are gonna be really top skills that employers are gonna look for. Um, they also need to be able to prioritize multiple projects, have strong communication sk skills. And I always say like, if you get excited about creating processes and making sure they are efficient, this is a really great place for you to be, this, this space. Um, similar to sales and marketing roles, operations um, is great for entry-level positions, um, but also there is a ton of room for growth. The higher budgets you have, they're not going to put that in the hands of somebody with, you know, one-year experience. They need people with 
five, 10, 15 years of experience. Um, and so you can start with a budget of $5,000, but also that project budget could go all the way up to seven figures. So there's a lot of room for growth in this role, um, but also there's a lot of transferable skills. I, I think too, like when I worked at a nonprofit, you're working on a shoestring budget. And so you're just naturally managing lots of projects um, and, and getting shit done ultimately. And so even if you don't have the traditional project manager job title um, in, at a nonprofit or as a teacher, um, you have so many transferable skills that still can make you eligible for a mid to senior level project manager role. Questions about operations, project management, is this something that that any of y'all feel drawn to? Yeah, it's something that I'm interested in. Um, but yeah. A lot of the job listings that I've seen are looking for people that have got three to five years of experience in it, um, mm -hmm. experience in the software, that the man project management software that they're using. And mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get experience in the software if you're not actually doing the job. What, yeah. what titles are you yeah. looking at, Catherine, if you don't mind me asking? I'm looking at project manager, junior project manager. Have you checked out like um, project coordinator titles yet? Um, yeah, I had a look at project coordinator and project planner, but again, a lot of them were looking for the software experience because yeah. they're they're doing a lot of the planning. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. I would I would recommend those. Another way that you can um, you know look for positions that are going to be super relevant is the operations titles. That my wife used to be an operations manager at Adobe. Um, and, you know, that's very, very related to project management. I'd say like one of the core differences is operations managers usually are not responsible for managing a development team, like, you know, for software engineers that they manage. And of course, like project managers don't um, necessarily know how to code. If they do, they're probably called a technical project manager. But, um, you know, if you if you work in a, an operations manager, you may have a team of one or two or three people or uh, whatever, uh, some sort of team, but they're not going to be the developers, coder type people uh it's all going to be project based where you're probably doing stuff that doesn't require any kind of like uh changes to software updates to software kind of stuff so those can be other ways that you can get started in something that's going to be a direct pathway into project management without having uh, quite as relevant experience sometimes so ops specialist ops associate ops manager my first title in tech was ops associate uh and i managed an internship program which is kind of a big project and uh, did some other like special project stuff for this organization that I worked for. Um, but that's how I got started. Then I moved more into the sales and marketing direction. Uh, but definitely that was a good way to get into that space. If I wanted to keep going in that direction, I just ended up having a lot of success in a different area in that organization. But I'd say that's definitely something I would check out uh, as for, you know, like the job listings things, um, you know, there's probably uh, you know, 10 bullet points on, on any given listing, let's say, and like, you'll maybe qualify five or seven of them or four of them or six of them or whatever it is. You're never going to have all 10 of them probably. And if you do, then it's probably not a good fit for you. So also recognize that like some of those are the hard, hard requirements and they'll tell you some of them are not. Um, I've gotten jobs before where definitely I did not meet all of those qualifications. And there is gender bias in that where uh, women typically, um, in, in some of the research studies have been much less willing to apply for a job unless they have like two or three more bullet points than a man would typically feel comfortable applying for a job in. So keep some of that stuff in mind. Of course, I know, you know, maybe you have some of that information already. Maybe you're aware of that. Uh, of course, there's also the hard requirements stuff to it, but um, don't get too discouraged. There is a pathway. And like I mentioned in the, the chat there too, my brother came from a, a background in landscaping and in like local e-commerce sales stuff and some like uh, you know, more entry level kind of positions uh, and positions that had nothing to do with it broke in by doing a project coordinator role uh, at a uh, web design agency for two years, moved into full project management positions, had his companies every time pay for his certifications, never paid for his own certifications kind of stuff. So there are ways to get into tech, um, you know, in different kinds of pathways. Sometimes you have to start a little bit more entry level and then move your way up from there. But as I also noted in, in the chat there, um, he is, you know, he's, he's making a, a strong six figure salary. So he's super happy. He's got great benefits. Uh, you know, the, the kind of career that I think like all of us, you know, when we, when we first start a new career change, that's the kind of thing that we look forward to. And he didn't have any particular kind of super relevant experience, didn't have a college degree. Um, so, you know, 
there are possibilities to break in regardless of background. It's harder that way. Uh, if you already have some experience, you already have some transferable skills, you know, there's some certification type stuff like school 16, you can do some other kind of pathways that'll help you get started. But ultimately a lot of it is figuring out how to translate your skills and experience, and then how to actually get face to face with uh, recruiters and hiring managers and bypass the process where you're going to be, you know, one out of 500 people applying one out of 200 people applying and have more of that direct pathway. in, so you can at least get to the, the first interview round and that networking piece of it. Uh, we provide a ton of support on. On here and we'll get into a little bit in this discussion but uh, that's that's where you're going to probably see the most results um, when you don't have that title uh, already is through networking and, and getting those kind of connections that can help you to get bypassed uh, through that that initial just bulk impossible uh, application pool kind of thing so hopefully some of that's helpful thanks yeah of course yeah thanks for bringing up those like challenges Catherine because like I hear you it, it always takes me back to college. When you graduate college, you were told you have to get this four-year degree, and then you look for entry-level positions, and they're like, um, entry-level, three to five years experience required. And you're like, what did I do this for? Um, so I feel you. It's very real. And I, and I think what School 16, what we help a lot with is that like one-on-one um, -on -one career support that helps you better frame your narrative, your resume, your cover letter cover letter to match that job description. So even when you don't fit 70% of the bullet points, um, it you're showing that you actually do. Um, so any other questions from folks about operations or project management? Okay, we'll keep her moving. Um, so last but not least is going to be product management. Um, product development teams are responsible for understanding customer needs, creating something new, and bringing it to the market. So um, they are responsible for entire business lines or building significant new features to existing products. So I always like to think about like when Instagram first came out to what it is now. Product teams worked really closely with software developers to build out Instagram stories, to build out reels, all of those new features that they had. Um, besides choosing what to build, they also communicate the benefits and measure the performance of the product, which is really crucial duty within any company. So after Instagram stories was built out, project managers had to dig into the data to make sure people are using the feature and if not, they need to figure out why. So similar to a project manager, they're collaborating with sales teams, marketing departments, developer teams, as well as the lead leadership team on a consistent basis. Product managers are really important to every tech company. So we typically see folks with several years of experience land this type of role. Um, this does not mean that you um, there's no pathway for you to get there. So if product management, product marketing management, um, all of that is really exciting for you, uh, we encourage folks to start in a project manager or sales role. And that way you can work your way up. Because as I've already mentioned, sales and project managers, they're working with every department on the daily. Um, and so you're getting an understanding of what those needs are. You're communicating closely with your product managers. So um, if I am on the retention team, the customer success team at Zoom, and I'm seeing that clients are falling off and they're not renewing their business and they're all telling me it's because this feature does not work. I now need to talk to my product manager constantly and give them that feedback so that they can work with the developers to make those edits so that I'm not losing my, you know, the retention of my clients. Um, and so product managers are really important, um, but there's a lot of different entry points to get to that product manager role. We see um, some of the top skills for product managers are going to be problem solver, communication, analytical thinker, and then also somebody who's very strategic with the decisions that they're making. Product managers um, typically have some of the highest salaries in tech um, that where you don't have to learn how to code um, because of the autonomy level in the role, as well as the experience required. So that's why you're going to see those salary expectations starting up higher um, than that we've seen with other roles. And it's because product management is not something that entry level folks are getting into. Therefore, the salaries um, reflect that. 
So anybody interested in product manager, and that's totally fine if like, you know, right now you can't be there, uh, but you have a goal or a really deep interest in this path. Term, but um, I still predict management as a way in. Mm -hmm. or say that again, you kind of cut out, I'm sorry. <laughs> You had cut out, so I didn't hear all that you had said. I'm sorry, Catherine. Oh, okay. Might be having a connection uh, issue. Yeah. yeah, no, that's okay. Um, but yeah, anybody else like interested in product management or just have questions in general about product management? Um, what What do you think like as far as like, um, Certificate, like what would be a good certification if you were going to get um, to that would go towards? Would it be like a project management certification that would, and then like you said, experience that would kind of lead you to the product management role? Yeah. When it comes to certifications, I feel like there's never like a bad certification that's going to hurt your career. So mm -hmm. definitely if you got a project management certification, um, that could be great. But I always come back to experience is going to be the most important part and an applicable um, experience. And so if you, you know, come to a program like School 16, and we'll talk about it here in a second, but um, we really work on um, real life um, projects. So people are working on actual projects that you would do on the job. That's giving you some baseline understanding. Um, it's starting to give you the language that you need to be um, sharing um, these skills during interviews. Um, and it's gonna help employers be like, oh, I don't have to do as much training with them. Like, sure, maybe they they did this um, project in a, in a program like ours in an insulated project, but they got that framework that makes it a lot easier to onboard, you know, Heather than it would be to onboard so-and-so who didn't do a program um, like School 16 that gives you that project-based learning. That's the word I was looking for. Oof, my words are not working today. Um, is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And then Aliyah, I saw that you're you're interested possibly in product management. And, and again, just based on what you had said in your intro that you've worked in nonprofits, um, I really just have a lot, it's like nonprofits and social workers and teachers, they have, they work in so many different things. They do so much that their skills are very transferable. So don't, didn't know if you wanted to add something, Aliyah, off mute or. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I actually had two like pseudo producty roles within nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I just, again, I think I just get really intimidated when I think about how to transfer that. Like both mm -hmm. times I was working with the nonprofits to develop an app to be used for like programming yeah. purposes. And yeah. so I feel like testing that app, like making sure it works, mm -hmm. managing the team, like doing the user training, like all of that, I feel like is related to product management so yes. applicable yes yes so, i don't know but somehow <laughs> yeah. like creating a product like that seems just worlds apart than from creating something like an instagram feature for example it just feels yeah. like so different content <laughs> i hear you i yeah. hear you but i i feel like I don't know. Think about like when you were 10 and like you thought about like what a teacher does, like that just seems so hard or what an accountant did just felt so hard. And not saying that those aren't hard, but like the closer you get, like the longer you're in your career, yeah. you kind of start to realize like we're all just faking it till we make it. You know, it's not <laughs> like some, it's not Bill Gates that is running the Instagram feature and the product design. Um, and, and, you know, if we put Bill Gates in that product management, Management role, we can be intimidated, but it is just somebody like you that is building out that feature with a team of folks. And so yeah. I always try to remind myself that when I'm starting to get intimidated in these roles, because you even the way that you shared that experience was like, oh, Aaliyah knows what she's talking about. You're using even the right words that if I were an employer, like looking for a product manager, I'd be like, ooh, okay, she knows what she's talking about. She's done testing. She's mm -hmm. rolled out a product. She's had to yeah. work 
or developers, those are all skills yeah. that, okay. are, that, that they want. Um, yeah. and, and going back to like our career coaches, which I kind of touched on there, that's what they're there to do is they're there to really help you figure out what is the language and the words I need in my resume and cover letter to get to that interview. And mm -hmm. then, oh shit, I got the interview. We're going to do now a mock interview. And mm -hmm. Aaliyah, I'm going to ask you every question that can come up during that interview. And then I'm going to give you feedback and then you're going to feel more confident. And then mm -hmm. once you get the job, like you have a community of, of career changers at your disposal, like joining a yeah. program like us. So everybody's kind of in that same boat of like, I'm underqualified, but you're not. Yeah, no. uh, Aaliyah, I want to add to that and just say too, like one, like there's the point Chelsea made about like how how impossible something feels. Like I actually used to think it would be impossible for me to work in tech. Uh, you know, I used to think like some of my friends got into tech. They were the geniuses that I knew in high school who actually yeah. like studied coding and stuff back then in 2003 or whatever, you know, like, so it was like, uh, oh, wow, these people got into uh, tech, but they, they were like a uh, perfect score on an SAT type of people. So like, can I really work in tech? And then you start to see, okay, there's, there's a, a bajillion different companies out there too. And so that's the other thing is like, yes, like maybe today when you think about like what if i worked at instagram as a product manager that's very intimidating that's also mm -hmm. like as somebody getting into nursing school right now saying like if i work at john johns hopkins you know as my first job or mm -hmm. cleveland clinic or something like that's going to be a real butt kicking because yeah i mean it probably would be right because it's your first job in, in the field so there's also that piece of it which is like i have a 150 product managers to chelsea's point too like we have the career advisors who can help there's also people within our networks because uh, like like Chelsea used to work in a coding boot camp. I used to work in a coding boot camp. I also used to work in a data science boot camp. Uh, the the instructors here are really well connected. The mentors here are really well connected. They do these jobs, right? So we have this huge network of people we can help to introduce you to as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I'd say again, like 150 product managers in my network. You know, most of them do not work at a Fang company, right? So. Uh, yeah. You know, there, there's like product man. I know a product manager who works at John Deere, the tractor company, uh, mm -hmm. develops products for them. You know, like you could be in any space. I used to know a data scientist who worked at Smuckers, the jam and jelly company. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could do this stuff kind of anywhere. Uh, but I'd say like that's the other thing with thinking about these like big company, big tech company jobs. Like everybody prioritizes those. I used to think it would be really cool. My wife has worked at Google. She's worked at Adobe. She's worked at Bloomberg. So she had some of those big company jobs. And I was always in the like really small startup space uh and there are definitely pros and cons uh to both sides mm -hmm. and i i will not probably move in that direction because i like the startup space i like the kind of agility within my role the ability to take on different kinds of responsibilities and to wear the different hats that kind of stuff uh, but i also love this kind of like energy and growth and excitement that comes with working in a startup and, uh, you know, sometimes working in a corporation is very meeting heavy and very bureaucratic. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's definite downside to that. There's the upside, of course, which is, you know, the stability and uh, some of the benefits can be better. Although if you're at a well-funded startup, they'll be the same anyhow. But, you know, it just kind of depends uh, what you thrive on. But I'd say like also worth noting and considering and then, you know, you know, kind of like level setting when you think about the fact that there's probably like millions of these product manager jobs. And, and again, like to Chelsea's point, like everybody's just a human being, like all these people that I met who became data scientists and they're now like principal data scientists or lead data scientists or a senior software engineer or whatever the, the people that I've met like five, six, seven, eight years ago. And they're like advanced in their roles. Or like, I know this guy at um, GitHub who's a director of technical enablement. And he was a teacher before uh, when I first met him. So, you know, like the, these are just regular humans, just like us. And, uh, and they just make a career change and they build their skills in a certain area and you hone in and you, you, you know, build your niche and you get really good at it and you specialize at it. And then you can start moving around to different places. And, and that's how my brother went from, you know, again, like being a project manager, um, really small web design agency. Uh, and then now at uh, one of the most well-known largest consumer goods companies in the world uh, with a huge salary. So, you know, there's, there's, yeah, all kinds of like starting points and positions and ways to break in and, and companies and company kind of sizes and uh, verticals and everything to consider. So anyhow, just food for thought there. Thank you. Of course. Love it. Okay. So the next slide is like questions. So I want to pause here. Like we can keep the conversation going on product management. Um, but really we could like if other questions have popped up, 
about sales or, or any of that. Um, any questions? We'll get into like more about who School 16 is. So you can save those questions if you'd like, but um, yeah. We could also share some of the info if, if you guys need some time to formulate questions and, and, uh, and come back for questions afterwards too. So whatever is easier. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll kind of dive into who we are as a program. Um, so at School 16, we've, we've really worked with hundreds of career changers who are really eager to level up their career and find a role that challenges them, but also, you know, pays their worth and has strong benefits and upward mobility and work-life balance and all of those other things that we as humans crave and want with our career. So our program is 16 weeks and it's where we help students like you break into tech. And we do that through skill building, um, career support, networking and mentorship and project-based learning. The first eight weeks of our program is what we call our foundations course, as it's a great opportunity for students to learn more about the tech industry, what are the jobs that exist, and how do they all function together. So you're going to dive even deeper into sales and customer success, operations, um, product management, um, all of, um, and digital marketing. Oof, I don't remember that. Um, so, so you're going to dive even deeper into that, um, into those roles. And then the next eight weeks is where you're going to pick um, one of those concentrations and deepen your learning and work on a project for the remaining eight weeks. Um, throughout the full 16 weeks, you will, will learn from a tech industry expert. And I'm going to talk about um, who our February cohort instructor is in a second. Um, but they are people who have had the jobs that our students want and are currently working in the tech industry um, with job titles that our students want. When you get into the um, advanced learning concentration, which is that second eight weeks, your um, instructor will have that job title. So if it is sales and customer success that you want to get into, and that's the concentration you choose, your um, instructor is going to have, you know, customer success manager at XYZ Tech Company. If it is product manager um, that it's, it excites you, our, um, your instructor is going to have, you know, senior product lead at XYZ Company. So you know that you're learning from somebody who actually does the work. Um, and you're also not, I, I don't want to say wasting time, but you're not wasting time talking about the theory of things. No, we get the theory of things. I want to know how to do the job. And I want to know how to share that with employers during the interview process. And then once I start the job, I want to be able to have the confidence to know what I'm doing. So that's what we're doing. We're teaching you those very applicable skills um, to help build that confidence all the way around. Um, as I mentioned, professional development is a huge part of the program. So not only are you going to learn those applicable skills that make you job ready, but you're also going to get one-on-one -on -one support with career coaches and mentors. Um, and so that's, again, like Aaliyah and Heather, you both have talked a, a lot about all of the skills um, and previous work that you've had. So now we're going to, it's, you know, you're going to be sit, um, sitting with our one on, um, having a one on one with our career coaches and being like, okay, here's all the skills that I've had. Um, this is all that I've done. And this makes a lot of sense if I wanted to stay in the nonprofit space, but how do I reframe these skills to make sense in um, the tech industry? How can I be specifically meeting these, um, you know, getting in front of these companies? And so that's really what our career team is doing is it's giving you that personal support to figure out what makes the most sense for you. Um, if you have the dream of, I wanna be a product manager, that's where I know I wanna go but I know I don't have the skill set um, to get that like, you know, $150,000 job just yet. What do I need to do in between? And that career coach is going to lay that out for you. Okay. These are the types of roles that you're going to want to apply for. These are the skills that you currently have that you're really going to want to lean on um, in those interviews. And this is kind of the path that you want to take to get to that $150,000 plus thousand job. Um, so they're really there to support you as well as the mentors, because I'm sure y'all have heard the saying, it's not always what you know, but who you know, that gets you the job. And so having that community to lean on, to build off of, to connect with, to understand what were the mistakes that you made um, that held you back from getting this job sooner? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? And, oh, hey, I see your company's hiring. Hook me up. 
So those are the network opportunities that we provide for our students, the resources that we give you on top of the skill building. Um, and we think that all of, we don't think, we know all of those things are what will get you the job at the end of the day and do it in a much more supportive space where it doesn't feel as scary because all of us are career changers. And so we all can learn from each other. Um, Tolu, he is our instructor for our February cohort and he's wonderful. Um, as I mentioned, we have experts that lead, um, lead our cohorts. And so he is a customer success manager at Google. He's going to be leading the foundations course of the February cohort. So again, that's going to be those first eight weeks. Um, he has been a um, instructor at school 16 for several of our cohorts. And he is so like truly very passionate about helping folks who want to make a career change into tech. So he really is all about teaching you, you know, that baseline knowledge that you have to have but also helping build out those connections um, so that you can start applying for jobs while in the program, because at the end of the day, that's what you want to do. You want to get a job at the end of the day. Um, our, um, we're going to host a Q&A with him next week. So I'll send y'all an invite um, tomorrow. So definitely register to attend that. Um, he, I, I, he's one of my favorite instructors and I have not even known him that well. I just see the immense support that he provides our students in Slack. I see the surveys and feedback. So I'm really excited to um, host this Q&A with him. So definitely if you are considering um, joining School 16 and even if you're not, I, I still think it's gonna be super valuable to get some um, insight from him. Last but not least, our application process. Um, so again, I'll send this information to you um, tomorrow. But what you do is you would head to this website here um, to apply to our program. Um, takes about five to 10 minutes tops to apply. Within one to two business days, um, you'll find, you'll hear back from Josh or myself if you've been invited to an interview. Um, if you are, we encourage you to um, schedule that immediately. The interviews are 30 minutes over Zoom, um, and they're just an opportunity for us to get a better understanding of what are your professional goals um, and, you know, what are you hoping to get out of the program to make sure that we can, you know, meet you where you are and, and support you in that journey. So it's just digging a little bit more into your background. Um, after the interview, um, then you would find out if you're accepted into the program, and then we would help you with those next steps on enrolling. Our next cohort starts Monday, February 27th. However, for the first time ever, um, we're doing an early bird discount to students who, um, you know, apply, um, are accepted and pay their deposit by February 17th. So our tuition is $59.50, but if you do all of those steps by February 17th, you're automatically going to get $1,000 off of your tuition. We still have scholarships available for students, so you can use that, um, you know, you can get the early bird discount plus still getting a scholarship. And then we have lots of different payment plans for our students um, that depend on um, that range anywhere from three months all the way up to 30 months, depending on your credit. Um, and so definitely like if you can, if 49.50 scares you off the bat, like that's fine. There's a lot of payment plans that can make that a lot more um, possible for you to do today. Um, all of our classes for the full 16 weeks, they take place two nights a week um, from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. So we are a part-time program. We know at the end of the day that y'all are still working. You still have bills to pay. And so we want to make sure that our program is accessible for students, um, for all of our students. So um, classes are 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, two nights a week for 16 weeks total. We are, um, because of this early bird discount, I know that it's definitely um, adding a lot more excitement for this February cohort. So I do highly recommend um, that you apply, um, you know, ASAP. So definitely apply tonight if this is at all of interest to you. We definitely would love to help support y'all on your goals. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we are way over time. So I so appreciate the folks that have decided to stay on. Um, but I want to kind of stay on for another five minutes um, to see if y'all have any more questions. 
So I don't have a question. Um, it's more just kind of 